Well, in a vote at the UN General Assembly where countries of the world were asked to condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine, 28 African countries voted in favor of the condemnation. 17 countries abstained, one country voted against the move to condemn the act, and eight African countries were not represented at all. Now, despite the variations in the positions of African countries on this global issue, the effects have left no country untouched. Now, from food insecurity to inflation to shortage of oil and gas, Africa has been significantly affected. Now, these are only some of the impacts, and we will unpack them all here on Villa Square Africa. Welcome, M. Suleiman. Now, the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine has left many perspectives in the world. It's a war, it's an invasion, it's two nations at long heads and one showing military superiority over the other. Now, more than Russia and Ukraine, every part of the world is also involved. The EU and the US especially are huge parts of the current discourse. Africa, with great dependence on Russia and Ukraine in the areas of agriculture and energy, is also affected. Other African countries are suffering the effects of this war, with prices of food commodities skyrocketing as a result of the inflation induced by the current war. The cost of bread is rising as the importation of wheat from Russia and Ukraine is massively affected by the war. North Africa is battling to produce more as it greatly relies on wheat. From Russia. Nations are closing borders to block the exportation of food materials, while those who have closed yards are reopening them to ease the shocks of the current situation. Now, more than food and oil, the security framework of the continent is suffering from a lack of attention as all eyes turn to how the world will end the war in Ukraine. Hunger is forcing the hands of many. Joining me to unpack this is Dr. Wale Ojewale. He's the expert. He's an expert on conflicts, organized crime, and security in governance in West and Central Africa. And of course, uh, he joins me from Dakar, Senegal, and Olua Femi Aratokun Ale. Uh, he's a security consultant from London. Also, Max Vardon, a humanist and African affairs commentator, corporate midwife. Gentlemen, welcome to the square. Good to see you all. Now, let's start with you. Uh, you know, um, I'd like to start with you. Yeah, yeah I'd like to start with you, Wally. Now, the, the presence of the Wagner Group in the Central African Republic and Mali and their alleged involvement in the ongoing war has uh, cast some attention on Central African Republic. Now, what does this mean to the country, especially with regards to support from the EU and the US? Thank you so much, Suleiman. Um, the starting point is to note, like you have rightly said, that uh, attention is less and less on African countries now, irrespective of their ties to either Russia or Ukraine. And then in terms of geostrategic interest of foreign countries, foreign powers like the United States, Russia and allied um, forces within the Western region of the world. Um, I, I think the full ramification is already unfolding with respect to how this is swinging uh, the die as far as uh, these countries that you mentioned is concerned. For instance, Mali and Central African Republic, due to the recent fallout that Mali had with the perennial colonial master, France, you realize that uh, as uh, European powers are vacating the spot, Russia is coming to fill the vacuum. And the, the bulk of this support is in the area of military support, particularly to these uh, two countries. Um, but what we can also say is the fact that um, the, the military support that uh, Russia is providing to any of these countries, to a large extent, particularly with the fallout of what is happening with Russia war in Ukraine now, which has gone contrary to 
popular pundit prediction that uh, within two, three weeks, probably uh, Ukraine is going to be under rubles. What that implies is that uh, Russia now needs to concentrate its uh, military attack at home front, which is likely going to affect the military support that they provide to these countries. Although that also comes with a lot of question mark, particularly with a fracture that we have seen in Mali, and then to a large extent, how this is undermining democratic institutions, democratic government, particularly within Africa. Uh, no doubt, we'll come back to look, uh, at, you know, to space it uh, on that and stretch it, especially now that you, you just landed on, uh, you know, how mm -hmm. it effect, uh, affects a democ uh, democracy on the continent. Uh, let's bring in uh, Ulua Femi here. And uh, this is also about uh, security, looking at Africa, so specifically how much F, uh, of an impact has the war in Ukraine had, uh, you know, on the continent? Um, thank you, Suleiman. Um, good evening, Nigeria. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, everybody watching us tonight. You see, um, the war in Russia and Ukraine might not be seen in Africa as um, the physical impact is being implied right in Europe. But what I can rightly tell you is um, the impact will soon be on the very high that we can, we can all see. Because number one, there is shortage of vegetable oil now in UK and the rest of the West and Europe as well. And um, the, short of, um, the shortage of all this will rightly be felt in Africa because we depend solely on, you know, importation of goods and services. And when we start seeing um, decrease in all these, then there's going to be high rise, um, high in food prices. And that is going to create a very serious tension to somewhere like um, Cameroon, Chad, and some other warring countries that we have in Africa that we have food shortage already. Then what we're going to be having is insecurity, as in people looking around for food to eat, and this will cause a lot of tension politically that Africa might probably be unstable because um, we depend solely on wheat and oil and some other things because um, we have land, but we're not producing. So this is where it's going to, uh, we're going to be hit so badly. And we're going to be seeing it very shortly as time goes on if the war is not ending very soon. If the war is not ending very soon. And I quickly like to bring in Max. Max, thanks for your time. And... Uh, Good to see you. Now, we're looking at inflation of food and other commodities. Uh, listening to uh, Olua Femi and uh, Wally, uh, what readily comes to mind will be what did African governments fail to do to ease the effects of the war? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Suleiman. Um, I think we need to see what's happening in Ukraine and Russia from a more uh, international or global perspective. You know, the last uh, couple of years where there has been an experiment going on on the ease of controlling populations and so on, yeah, the coronavirus lockdowns and stuff, uh, should be seen in the context of a globalist agenda which uh, has been articulated and described as the new world order. And I think um, here in Africa, we need to be very aware of the various trends that are interwoven in this particular object and to understand what that objective is. How it's likely to be robust and essentially undermine our uh, efforts at uh, progress and lifting this continent out of the difficulties it's in. So <clears throat> accepting that most African governments failed to anticipate that this conflict was, was going to take place and the ramifications thereof, uh, we are faced with immediate challenges of providing food and ensuring long-term food security. We are faced the challenge of ensuring that uh, we have energy security on this continent, which we shouldn't do yet because you know we are we are amply provided for in terms of energy resources. Unfortunately we have not managed them as well as perhaps we might. Uh, we also need to look at the supply chain disruptions 
and how they're going to impact whatever production uh, facilities and capabilities we have. And these are definitely going to impact our economic outcomes in the next few months and possibly a year or two. What this is likely to mean is that there's going to be social unrest and instability in a number of countries. We've already seen Sri Lanka spiral out of control uh, because of the shortages and so on, and the politicians failing to acknowledge and understand that the population was going to be extremely <clears throat> at what they seem to be the failure of the political system. I believe that we are likely to see uh, increasing tensions in Africa where this various populations are going to massacre, march and protest and uh, take matters into their own hands. And for African governments, I think they need to be sensitive to the populations and the anxieties and fears that they have and start to make reconciliatory noises, uh, adopt a more inclusive approach in which they consult with various stakeholders within their country. Otherwise, we're going to see increasing polarization. We're going to see uh, debt crises leading to uh, you know, domino effects where country after country may, 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 may start to collapse. And uh, there will definitely be uh, players within the region, especially the Islam Islamist players, as above so, who will seek to take advantage of such unrest and instability to seize territory and to uh, establish a stronger presence in the various sub Okay, all right, Max. Let, let, let me jump in here, Max. Uh, apologies for buttoning. Uh, I, I just want to quickly bring in Wally uh, back, uh, who also uh, was trying to put his finger on democracy in, in uh, you know, on the continent. But listen to all three of you, uh, gentlemen. One of the key things will be uh, thinking of what uh, COVID did to the world, especially Africa, by exposing the continent. Uh, you know. Pants down. Uh, now, uh, Wally, help us here. With this war uh, and, you know, civil strife that we've seen in, you know, parts of the continent, is it safe to say um, Africa was unprepared, caught pants down to the extent that even Nigeria had to break into its barn to release some grains uh, to sustain uh, its population? Thank you so much, Suleiman. Um, I think uh, there is this culture of um, unpreparedness on the part of most African states. And um, I'm very excited about the way you have flipped the larger conversation about Africa preparedness. Because if you look at what a lot of experts have been saying, and even what some um, public sector actors have been saying, it has been like, uh, oh, how can African countries publish for, I mean, profit from the wartime energy crisis that is occasioned as a result of Russia war in Ukraine now. And then looking at, um, at the statistics, I will give you um, if, if you have some figures. For instance, if you look at wheat, annually, the trade balance between Africa, particularly in terms of what we purchase from Russia and Ukraine is about $9.4 billion according to the African Development Bank, for which alone, entire African continent. And then I also saw that uh, in some countries, the price of bread has gone 60% above what it used to be pre-Russia war in Ukraine era. And you agree with me that bread is a common food in Africa. And like um, earlier speaker said, if you go to the point that bread suddenly becomes a scarce commodity in terms of cost and probably not even available to people, I mean, French Revolution was started as a result of, <laughs> of bread. <laughs> so, you know, you never can tell what is going to happen in this climate. And when you look at the, 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 the preparedness, which I think compared to COVID-19, you know, during COVID-19, the popular conversation is how our public health system is going to be strengthened post-COVID so that in case another pandemic comes upon us, we are able to, I mean, we stand uh, and build resilience to be able to go to, to pull through that. But you and I, we agree, I mean, you will agree with me now that post-COVID, anyway, 
from perhaps a lot of African states have been lucky and the predictions of funding have not come through, uh, which uh, they said people are going to be dying on the streets, people will be packing a lot of dead bodies on the road. That didn't come true. But uh, I can, we can safely conclude that it appears like Africa has suddenly moved on. And it's like we don't emphasize that another pandemic can come in the days to come. Now, if you flip it around, we're just talking about wheat now. And nobody knew the extent to which we're dependent on Russia and Ukraine, particularly with respect to wheat supply to African continent. African Development Bank has deployed about $1 billion. But you know, you can't plant wheat that we're going to eat tomorrow today. So, I mean, as commendable as that appears, uh, it's not solving the pressing challenge that we have at hand now. So how do we begin to emphasize natural occurrences that might go beyond human control? How do we even begin to live as a continent in the light of uh, future pandemics that may come upon us? How do we build systems, build institutions that are resilient, build economies that are resilient, inject capital into the economy so that Africa can be better prepared? I think two opportunities have come now, and we are already going through the second phase. In less than two years, and uh, it has come to test our preparedness which I think we are not, I mean, we are not really doing well, and that is the reason why it is eating us hard. And we hang on this to Laiman. Mm -hmm. The last thing which is very, very important is the fact that, uh, like I said, there's a lot of conversation about how we can have best the opportunity um, of the divestment that European countries are trying to be, to make out of this, and win themselves from um, Russia energy pipeline, and begin to source for frontier markets for hydrocarbon, and supply that will power the homes and industries in Europe. But beyond that, I think what is also very important for me is for us to look at um, the fact that uh, are we now not dancing to another new energy colonialism in Africa? Why am I saying that? About 600 million persons in Africa do not even have access to electricity at all. About 900 million people in Africa do not have access to clean, ener clean cooking energy. So uh, I think the conversation shouldn't be so much about how we can profit from energy supply to Europe, but how do we look at the continent? Because imagine tomorrow, if another natural disaster, war, or pandemic hits the world and Africa is at the receiving end, you recall that European nations, Western nations, ensure that they fascinated their people before they start passing the remaining vaccine to Africa. So uh, much more about uh, uh, celebrating the fact that Africa can emerge as the new energy powerhouse to supply energy to Europe. I think we should also look at that, at, at, at that conversation and flip, flip it around and see how we can look inward and retool the national and regional strategies that can make us to be self-dependent um, self to start with and then um, much more than depending on some of these countries. Let, 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 me, let me jump in there, uh, uh, Wally. Uh, thanks uh, for that. Uh, and uh, uh, this is for you, Oluwa Femi. Listen to Wally, what readily comes to mind. By the way, uh, you, you talk, spoke about bread. In Nigeria, specifically in Lagos, which is uh, uh, the commercial nerve center in Nigeria, uh, the prices of bread have increased uh, to the extent that people are wondering. And this is coming after President Buhari in April ordered the release of 40,000 metric tons of grains to Nigerians. Now, quickly here, um, uh, Femi, uh, over the years, uh, hunger has been one of Africa's main challenges. Uh, for a lot of Africans, uh, they, they still can't forget, you know, pictures, disturbing pictures of you know, starving children in some parts of the continent to the extent that a lot of other people thought that that's how the continent uh, has remained. It's easy for terrorist organizations uh, to convince uh, people, uh, you know, to join their group because uh, they're hungry. How does this moment impact the security of these countries where the effects uh, are more obvious? Well, um, thank you, Suleiman. Um, let me jump in quickly and try to correct some narratives, which you will surely um, agree with me. Growing up in our primary school days and secondary school days, we do some kind of um, subjects, and of not even kind, we do a subject called agricultural science. Where has it really led Nigeria to right now as we speak? In so many polytechnics and universities, 
we have some departments, we have some um, courses whereby we have all these agri-economics, agricultural science in this, agricultural science in that. Again, what is the usefulness of it? What is the benefit today to Nigeria as a country? So if that should be the case, I think we should cover our hands, cover our faces, and just craft some things that we can see that is not working rather than importing and we have resources, we have the land, we have the manpower, we're not making use of them, and we're now at the receiving end of Ukraine, America, Europe, and all the rest. Having said that, back again to the question you asked me, we all know the primary and the glorified wheat um, flour in Nigeria, in Lagos, which is the agege bread. It's gone up. Agege bread is not something anybody can buy again. You have to be very wealthy, very rich now to buy agege bread, despite the fact we see it as one of the most common breads so far. What about other food? What about other food that we prepare through flour? How are we going to source for all this? Who is going to source for it for us? We are not having the technology right now to produce all this. The pandemic seems not to have taught us any lesson. Now we're with the Cold War. How are we learning from it? Do you think we're learning at all? Or personally, saying it this way, rather than glorifying Dan Gauthier refinery for using fertilizer, not even for Nigeria, not even for Africa, but exporting them out to other countries, Western countries, are we truly benefiting from it? If we are, then we shouldn't be talking about issue of food. Look at Ben Wisted, look at Makoji, look at Joss. They are all suffering the same thing, bandits everywhere, ravaging and you know, ransacking their food. So we're gonna be seeing this issue going on and on. At the moment, a lot of people don't know why the food is so on the high price today. But maybe after this program, a lot of people will start doing their research and start thinking, is this why all this is happening? So Ukraine is a better country producing so much that we don't even know. This is why they are so, so, um, how do I say? They are so patriotic, Ukrainians are so patriotic that look, we will do anything to save our country rather than run away. We will do everything to salvage this country, to save our land rather than give it out to Russia. But do not forget one thing, Russia is playing a part in distributing and supplying the continent, supplying the world with food, grains and flour as well and oil. So they are both playing the same part but we need to look for a lasting solution to resolve this. Having said that, let us look inwardly now to Africa. We've got the mass land, we've got the population, but we're not making use of it. Rather, we're focusing more on policies that's not gonna work for us. We're focusing more on individual selfish interests that is not working for us, whereby Europe is focusing on an ordinary person, ordinary man walking the street. But we are not looking at all that, rather we're suppressing ourselves. And the more we suppress ourselves, terrorism will definitely prevail. Terrorist group will definitely have a say that come to me, will provide a X, Y, Z for you to assure you your safety and follow our ideology. And this is where I think Africa is driving to at the moment. Do not forget Morocco, Egypt, Tunisia, Mali, Chad, they are all powerful people that, you know, they eat all this wheat bread, grains, different ways in different, um, in different platforms. But right now, the food is on the increase. And if it's on the increase within that area, there's going to be, um, you know, social economy unrest. And when we have all this going on, it's definitely going to try, you know, it's going to travel down to the northern part, from the northern part down to other areas. This is one of the reasons why I see our politicians using food as a source of politics in campaigning disease in Nigeria. Not talking about Nigeria. Uh, I'm coming to you, Max, and uh, you know, listening to uh, Wally and Lua Femi uh, talk about you know food. Uh, what readily comes to mind will be uh, some of the very unsavory stories in Nigeria. We recall then in 2020, November of 2020, dozens of farm workers killed in what uh, journalists have described as an insane attack as if that wasn't enough in uh, 2021 we also saw uh, some nigerian farmers that were executed and uh, again in uh, nigeria about 78 nigerian farmers were murdered uh, it got to a point people said even these farmers couldn't go to the farms now if you put this side by side with what was seen in russia would you say the 
insecurity that we have witnessed uh, in uh, Nigeria and in some parts of West Africa and also the Horn of Africa have also uh, caused the continent uh, a big setback. Yes, I would say so. And I would go further uh, to say that I believe these attacks are not just random attacks. I think they are deliberate attacks at African food sufficiency, self-sufficiency. A nation that cannot feed itself is completely vulnerable. It's completely vulnerable to its, uh, its, its, its sources of food. And uh, people in the world know this. Unfortunately, most of African governments, I don't think, are fully appreciative of this fact. And this is partly because we pamper our politicians, we, we, we feed them too well, they live too comfortably, and they get very quickly out of touch with the challenges of the common man. Uh, but those who mean Africa hard know this. So they target our farmers and they basically scare people off the land so that we lose our self-sufficiency and we start to become dependent upon external sources for our continuation. Um, I think we should take this as a wake-up call. We cannot, we, we, we cannot take our food security for granted. And we need to take very, very active steps to not only to make the land more secure, but also to ramp up our productivity so that for the land that's in cultivation and so on, we get a lot more out of it than we have been getting so far. Subsistence farming isn't going to cut it. And I'm very encouraged by the uh, Songhai movement. I don't know if you've heard of it. Where <clears throat> it's, it's a Nigerian scientist, actually, who said this thing up in Benin, where he's actually created an eco-cyclical system in which he's farming both cereals and grains and uh, you know, crops alongside fish, alongside livestock. And essentially, he's using the outputs or the effluent from one stage of the process as an input to the next stage, and then from that stage to the third as an input, and so on. So it's a highly circular, highly, highly, highly efficient mode of production. And because of this, in fact, some people call it the zero waste system, because everything essentially is recycled, apart from the outputs from the farm, which of course can go to market centers and so on. And even is able to generate enough energy to keep the uh, production uh, equipment and so on going. And this from a piece of land that before was just bang, just savanna, grass, something. So it is not as though the technologies are not there. We have the technologies, but we are not promoting them. We are not making them visible to those who would most need them. We are not investing in these technologies and spreading them across Africa so that our, our, our food production goes up to become much more self-sufficient in food than we are today. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, Wally, Max has said something quite instructive, instructive here. Oh. A nation that cannot feed itself remains vulnerable. And it looks like that's what uh, even uh, Lua Femi has said by reminding us that back in the day, not just in Nigeria, across a lot of African countries, students were taught early in their school life uh, the essence of agriculture. And uh, Max said, look, it, it should have gone beyond subsistence farming. Uh, but here we are at the moment. Uh, help us here, uh, uh, Wally. Uh, still talking about conflicts and the impact that this has uh, uh, caused the continent. Uh, what can the continent do uh, to change the course and perhaps uh, make other parts of the world look to... Because people like experts like yourself will always say, Africa has more than enough to feed the continent and the rest of the world. 
Yes, thank you so much, Suleiman. Um, it's important to, to cast our mind back to uh, what Femi said. I could recall vividly that my primary school had a mini farm where corn is planted, the same thing in secondary school. But most universities, I mean, in some of the poorest countries in Africa or those underdeveloped or developing countries in Africa can't even, I mean, attend to basic issues of governance because at the basic level of human living is three um, um, basic issues, which one is food, shelter and clothing. And before you talk about uh, issues of artificial intelligence, internet of things, these and that, that, I mean, that drive civilization now, uh, those basic things, any serious country must be able to, to attend to them. And to the extent to which these things are now eating us left, right and center, and when you consider the state of instability in some of these countries, I mean, pre Russia war in Ukraine, pre COVID 19, you realize that a lot of things have become complicated lately. But um, it is not too late to start. But what we can say is the fact that um, we have to continually stay in a proactive mode as a country and as a continent. And I think the starting point is going to be three levels. What is each country doing to be self-sufficient in some of these issues that we are raising, particularly food, I mean, food security. One of the, we are extremely blessed. The entire Congo Basin forest from, from DRC up to Gabon is second to Amazon in the world. I mean, you have everything imaginable, whether it is a modern, I mean, the modern, technology that is going to power our electronics, our cars in the days to come. Congo DRC has it in abundance in Cobalt, Cotton, and all those things. And our forests are rich. So you, I mean, we have arable lands. If you go to, to the northern part of Nigeria, you go to Niger, you go towards Chad. These are places where if agriculture is not working, you can harvest um, wind energy in those places. And it's not really going to cost much. When you realize what politicians are stealing out of Africa, and you compare that with the, the, the required capital to drive development, it, it, it pales um, insignificantly. So I, I think, uh, uh, like I said, what is, what is each country doing? At the state level, we need strategies and response. <clears throat> And then at the sub-regional level, what is ECOWAS going to galvanize support of heads of state to be able to tackle some of these things? What is SADIC doing in the Southern Africa to be able to galvanize the support of the head of state to tackle this thing regionally? What is the ECA doing in East African economic community to be able to galvanize support on of Africa? And some of the Northern um, um, Africa, even though they are mostly affiliated to MENA in some of their policy and and diplomatic uh, outlook. But I think then what is the African, uh, African as a continent is doing? Like I said earlier, African Development Bank has, in, I mean, promised to inject $1 billion to, 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 to drive food sufficiency in Africa. But that is insignificant compared to the trade volume between African countries and Ukraine and Russia, which is to, nine, to the tune of $9.5 billion annually. That is emerging when you look at the full import of that. So uh, it's important for us to look in what build capacity, but essentially we can be talking about subsistence farming at this level. Um, about 5% of, um, uh, 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 I mean, in the, in the United States of America, for instance, uh, for instance, about 5% of the population is provided the food uh, required and they are also exporting out of that because food processing from agricultural feed is extremely extremely mechanized and modernized. But when you come to Nigeria, for instance, about 60% of our population is engaging in subsistence agriculture. Some of them cannot even feed their family. And the same statistics, is, 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 it can be generalized to most of the African countries. So when you look at these, I think modern, modernization, mechanization are the missing factor and capital injection is also missing in this regard. But um, it is going to compound the state of security in the countries if uh, urgent attention is not put into this. A lot of the countries are already, I mean, presently unstable. And when you had food insecurity to that, it's like pouring gasoline into fire. Hmm. So now um, uh, let's uh, talk more about this and uh, see how uh, much of protection uh, some of these farmers, because uh, 
We've also seen what some of the countries and even uh, the uh, some agencies, uh, in, uh, the, the, the kind of intervention they've made to ensuring that these farmers are able uh, to still go to their farms. Uh, some have actually actually relocated. So uh, the greatest uprising seen in Arab Africa was partly a case of increasing food prices. Uh, yes. Uh, are there possibilities of sub-Saharan Africa facing something of the nature now, especially with rising poverty rate and shocks of COVID-19? Oluwafemi. Thank you so much, Suleiman. Um, Wale and Max, you've actually contributed so much that um, <laughs> I'm really just wondering what um, our government and other African governments are doing at the moment. Um, I think, you know, during the COVID-19, let's start from there. We, we were thinking, okay, we're going to learn a very hard lesson. Two years down the line, we've not really seen any good impact positively. And um, right now, um, Russia, Ukraine is just like coming to us as a shock. Not really a shock. We were actually aware about it for a long time, but it was bringing up gradually. But at the moment, we have no impute, no impact, no say to how is it going to affect us or what is going to be our own contribution towards it. So Africa is going to be at the receiving end all the time. And um, being at the receiving end, that means we cannot dictate. They would dictate for us, and we had to obey and abide by whatever rules we were given. Because even during the COVID-19, we were not a, a powerful member in deciding what kind of vaccine to be used. They were actually giving us what to use at their own terms and conditions. And we have no choice than just to go with it. The same thing will be happening after that is after if this whole conflict should end up quickly, can we be um, a deciding factor? Apparently, no, we're not going to be. But if we can be, are we learning from anything at all? Or are we just going to be going around the whole thing like a barber chair in the salon? I think that is exactly where we are. We are now at the crossroad, as in, do we go back to the drawing table and start all over again? Or we not try to listen to ourselves and talk the real truth to ourselves. Let me jump Looking in here. Days, sorry, sorry to cut to you. Let me jump in here. And yeah. this is still to you, Oluwafemi, before I go to Max. Okay. Uh, I, I, I want you to uh, bring in your uh, security consultancy cap here now. Yeah. Because okay. how, much, how much of an opportunity is the current situation for African governments to build their military for, you know, periods, nations uh, can actually uh, get to uh, move this battle, you know, out of the region or to the enemy? So, the man, um, let me be honest with you. We are not building capacity in terms of military strategies. We are not building capacity in terms of military might. We are not building security strategy in terms of securing our own little community so how do we want to drive this to the African countries or to the continent? Look, we have everything written very good by experts on paper, but in reality, we do not have anything. I have been coming to Nigeria to come and deliver training programs, not only for the police, not only for the civil defense, but for corporate bodies as well, for individuals as well. So I can tell you, we are nothing, but um, I don't know, you see, I don't want to rate us down, Mm -hmm. but we're categorically, you know, off the line. Let me give you or cite a very typical example for you. We have what we call the criminology department in some universities in Nigeria today. I have been in talks with some, I've been doing Zoom training with some people, and I can tell you the basic stuff that you see a common, an average Ukrainian, an average Russian, an average European that will say in terms of security words, we don't know it. So how do we drive this capacity to the level of, you know, um, bringing them to debate or maybe to confront or maybe to serve or, you know, to deliver businesses in terms of security defenses? Let me, let me bring, in, let, let me bring in Max here now. Sorry again to butt in. Let me bring in Max here okay. now. Ma Max, let's look at the, the leadership on the continent. Uh, listening to every uh, one of you, it still points to the leadership. 
uh, we have the AU, we have other sub-regional groups like the ECOWAS and that of the Eastern African Bloc. But what can the AU do <laughs> to actually redirect some of the key things uh, you all have highlighted on the, on the square? Right. Uh, unfortunately, as the AU is trying to structure, <clears throat> it doesn't look to me like they can do very much. The uh, Constitutive Act that I brought it into play describes it as a facilitating organization. It is there to help African heads of state to speak with one voice. And so, in many respects, it's responsive to what the African heads of state say they want to do. The AFCFTA is an unusual example where they have actually taken the ball and run with it and brought in the uh, leadership of the various uh, regions along with them. And it's, it's a very commendable thing. Um, if they could transform, uh, uh, use that model also to help transform our military sector so that we are better prepared, um, it, that would also be wonderful because you know part of the problem we face on this continent is that and, you know people have mentioned democracy. Um, I have an issue with democracy as it, as it is practiced on the African continent, and I think we were sold a lot, we were sold a line of thinking which, in actual fact, is, was designed as a tool for divide and rule. And so, you know, some have estimated that in, in Africa, we spend 40% of our energies fighting each other rather than fighting the common enemy of poverty, illiteracy, hunger, and so on and so forth. And I think we could learn a lot from uh, a country like, which also is a democracy, but it's not a Western multi-party style democracy. And we've all been witness to the great leaps and bounds that China has achieved in two generations, where they brought 400 million people out of poverty. Yeah? So I think we need to rethink our government structures. I think we need to start putting more of a premium on intelligence, on information, on understanding the world that we inhabit, and what is going on and how it may impact us. Um, mention was made of our COVID, of COVID preparedness. And a lot of people feel that Africa was shortchanged, that we didn't get the vaccines that we should have. And so on. I'd like to throw a spanner into that particular works. I think Africa actually benefited from not getting these so called vaccines. Because these mRNA technologies that were put into these vaccines were actually based on a very toxic part of the virus, being a spike protein. Yeah? And that spike protein, which is an artificially engineered substance, contains segments of the AIDS virus. And already, governments around the world are beginning to report a rise in vaccine-induced AIDS amongst the population. So I think we were lucky that we did not get these vaccines because they are a slow toxin of people. Some people died immediately, others in, in months, and others will be dying in years to come. Now, <clears throat> that does not mean we should be complacent because I believe COVID was a test run in in terms of lethality, it was only about 1%, 1 to 2% uh, uh, fatal for people who were infected. Yeah. And with the right medication and so on, you could lower that down to, to less than 0.5%. So we were lucky here in Africa. But again, it was a wake up call that we did not have the people, the technologies, the, the facilities to analyze what was going on and to fashion our own response to it. And I'm very mindful that Fauci and Gates on several occasions 
smile to themselves as they announce that it is likely something far, far worse or that. You know, uh, I hope uh, it looks That's like a space that I did. Now, I lost it for a bit there. Yeah. I think it, it, was, it was frozen for a bit. I apologize, uh, Max. Okay. Uh, but now you're back. Right. Uh, so I'll let you land so okay. that I can go, I can go to uh, uh, Wally. Okay. I, I, was, I, was talking about, I, I was talking about biosecurity. And I was saying that, again, COVID was a wake-up call to Africa that we are not prepared. We weren't prepared for COVID. And if something like uh, cowpox or monkeypox comes along, which has surface in conversations with um, the people behind the COVID. We face a very, very difficult task because the lethality rate of those boxes is something like 30%, 30%. Now, something else that we need to consider is that when conflicts and so on arise, yeah, like this Russia-Ukraine conflict, very often it's a diversionary tactic. It's a side show to divert our attention while something else is going on. Well, what else is going on? Let me tell you, the World Health Assembly is meeting from Sunday onwards for four days. On the agenda for that meeting is a proposal that World Health Organization countries should sign over their sovereignty to the World Health Organization where health matters are concerned. So the risk we face is that we are going to agree for the World Health Organization to take control of our health management systems. And if they declare that there's an epidemic in this part or that part of your country and you should shut down your economy in order to accommodate that, we will have no choice but to comply. Okay. Um, let, let, let me let me jump in here. Apologies, uh, we're winding down. Let me bring in Wally. Uh, and now, in all of this, in all of this, uh, trying to make sense of what's happening, uh, looking at all three of you, looking at a lot of Africans in the diaspora and friends of the continent, uh, doing very well. You know, proffering you know solutions and ideas and also inventions. Now let's bring it back home and see. How can Africa, uh, while they help us here, contribute to the settling of the current crisis as it is? Because it looks like a lot of these countries are sitting on the fence. Well, <laughs> this is a very tough one because, uh, you know, uh, for you to be able to take a place uh, in the Committee of Nations, I'm not sure we've done sufficient, um, um, have we put sufficient works in place to justify uh, a sitting on the table, uh, apart from maybe South Africa that has tried to, because this is a matter of geopolitics and then and national strategic interest is very, very important in this. So uh, you must have made critical investment uh, in building um, global partnership with uh, frontier countries mm -hmm. in terms of military might, in terms of science and technology, in terms of uh, educational advancement that is generating ideas that is driving modernity. So I don't think we've done sufficiently in that regard because, um, for instance, if we talk about education, for instance, now, I think uh, like in a country like Nigeria, it's almost an annual ritual that our universities go on strike. And I think there's a popular saying that I've read somewhere that uh, a laboratory that is going to provide, I mean, that is going to um, um, produce a Nobel laureate, light is not going to go off there for 25 years. So what does that mean um, in terms of uh, building bio and cyber technology that is going to help, I mean, that is going to propel us to be able to take our place uh, uh, among the Committee of Nations? What is the what, what, most African countries? What what is the object? What is the central objective of their foreign 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 relation in terms of how they relate with country? There's a development story that just came out about two or three hours uh, ago now that the Congress in the United States is about to pass a law that is going to monitor Russia's movement in Africa. Can you imagine that? So uh, 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 have we 
uh, ceded a sovereign power to foreign countries. These are some of the things that are very, very important. And then to what extent are we really self-dependent continentally? Um, you talk about AFCTA. Most of the times when I hear about it, I just laugh. Because, uh, for instance, even within the continent, how integrated are the countries? You live, in the, you live in Dakar, you want to travel to Equatorial Guinea, you will first have to go to Togo, they take you to Gabon. You want to travel from Nigeria to, I mean, to, to, to Tunisia, you are going to fly to Germany, you fly over, over, over Tunisia to Germany. So uh, how much in terms of uh, integration for trade is even African countries to start with? How much do we really respect ourselves in, in, in building foreign relations and partnership? I, I, I think we are not ready to really decide uh, our geopolitical interest um, uh, is being influenced globally. Mm. But it is not too late to start. What mm. is disheartening for me is that African countries are not showing that they are really preparing to take a place in the global affairs of nations. And it, and it takes a long-term plan. China decided to be where they are today through a strategic vision that lasted over 40 years. And they, 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 are, still, they are still preparing. So I, I don't really see so much of that preparedness on the part of Africa because we are not making critical investment in areas that are very, very important. The wars of the future are not going to be fought on the battlefield. They will be fought in cyberspace. How prepared are we in this regard? Hmm. Uh, that's, a, that, that, that's, a, that's a big question. And uh, I'd like to bring Max here so that I'll uh, come back to uh, Oluwa Femi so that we can close up the show. Uh, but quickly, uh, Max, uh, off the top of my head, I'm trying to... Uh, go around what uh, Wally said. And uh, is there a way uh, the continent can learn from Russia and Ukraine in terms of relationships and power tussle uh, and how to promote regional peace? Um, that, that's a tough one. So uh, Ukraine, I think, uh, was misled by NATO and the West. I, I think this conflict would have been avoided if they decided to stay neutral. Mm. But forced with uh, or encouraged by the West to start making noises and to accept uh, uh, the, the idea of NATO membership and certainly training and so on from Western forces. And uh, we shouldn't forget the Cuban Missile Crisis where uh, President Kennedy showed us to go to nuclear war just because Russia was sending some missiles to Cuba, which is a lot further from the heartland of the United States than Ukraine is to Russia. Yeah? And so I think this is a deliberate ploy on the part of NATO and the US to the Russian. And if there's a lesson to be learned, it, it, I suppose it is that uh, we should follow the course of non-alignment that was uh, pioneered in NASA, in Kwame Nkrumah, in Nyerere, and so on, and mind our own business. You know, we have enough on our peaks, bringing our people up and out of poverty and so on, without having to worry too much about what's going on in the rest of the world, except in so far as their machinations impact on our stability, our security, and our prosperity. Okay, let me bring in Oluwa uh, Femi uh, so that we can close. Oluwa Femi, I know it's tough to do this in uh, less than two minutes. Uh, quickly here, listen to all what we've highlighted here. I want us to also bring in the uh, education sector. We saw a lot of Africans affected by that war uh, in Ukraine owing to uh, the bad, you know, education sector across the continent, specifically in Nigeria. What should leaders or the continent uh, be looking to doing to ensure that, uh, well, that doesn't repeat? Uh, basically, um, Suleiman, this is a very tough one, but let's look at it globally. Let's look at Africa in general. Nigeria is not the only country hit with this um, educational sector with this cold war going on. Ghana has got, let me say, about two to 3,000 people of their um, citizens studying in Ukraine, now back home. We have Morocco, about 9,000 back home now. We have Egypt as well, about 3,000. And we have Nigeria, close to about 5,000 
or more, not only in Ukraine, across board in Eastern European countries, Western European countries, we have no cause for outstanding. Why? Because we fail to seize the opportunities we had, or our fathers, or our great father, our great grandfathers, you know, they had in those days. We have failed to capitalize in utilizing education as another big investment in Africa. And now, the moment they start biting, it will bite hard. It's not yet, it's not going to bite now. Hmm. Why is this? Number one, let them finish up, let them start any money, let them start back, you know, back to job and all the rest. You will now ask yourself this question, are they coming back to Africa to come and invest or are they going to stay where they see life as easy as possible to start living? At this very junction, Suleiman, Max, Wally, I will tell you one thing. We're going to have loop-sided people that will be governing us because we have failed to capitalize on the young entrepreneurs, young boys, young girls that have gone out that have a good idea into how to develop Africa to give them a chance to do so. In my own case, people might criticize me. I have been coming back and I've been doing my own beat. But how many of us are out there? How many dance ones are out there ready to come back it, it, and it, be given it's, a chance? It's, it's to a do big stuff? question. It's not a rhetorical question. It's a question that Africans must answer. And I'd like to thank yes. you, gentlemen, for your time. And we're hoping that thank now, so as Nigeria moves towards an election year, as uh, also Kenya is going into the election and a couple of other African countries. These are conversations we must have. The leadership recruitment process to fix in the continent. Many thanks for being social nice company, Dr. Wale or Jawale, and of course, Oluwa uh, Femi, Aratokun Ale, and Max Vardon. Many thanks, gentlemen, for being thank here you. on thank the Thank you so square. much, Lehman. All right, okay, I'll see you guys again. Bye bye.